Our lives are powered by electricity. And as the world moves forward, we're only ever going to need more. And this makes the UK's aims of becoming net zero even more challenging. So how does all this energy get to our homes and businesses to help power our lives? Where does it come from? And what's being changed to make sure our energy supply is cleaner and greener? I'm James, and I'm on a journey with National Grid to find out just how our electricity transmission system works. From all the way out here by the sea to here in our sockets. So come and join me as I venture behind the grid. The UK's electricity grid transports energy all around the country from where it's generated to where it's needed. But what I really want to know is how does that electricity get around? I know it involves pylons and cables and some things called substations. And I'd quite like to know what all that actually means. So I've come to Dinorwick here in North Wales. And rumour has it there's a power station and a substation inside a mountain. Yeah, inside a mountain. So I'm on my way to meet Ash who's going to tell us exactly what happens inside electric mountains. Ash, thanks for having us here at Electric Mountain. What, what have we got? What are the different layers? What's above us? What's below us? Give me the geography. Give me the map. Absolutely. So we're in a, a huge cavern uh, inside the mountain that was excavated in the early 80s. And the cavern's got a number of floors in it. Yeah. Uh, and actually, if there were no floors in the cavern, you could fit St. Paul's Cathedral inside. In here? In here, absolutely. How did they get, like, literally with shovels and spades? Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Hand dog removed. There'll have been some, um, you know, plant and equipment and machines and things. And how long did that take from when they started to making the tunnels? So it took 10 years to build the Norwig altogether. At the bottom we've got a turbine hall um, and then our substation is on a floor above. Right, I want to see some stuff. Absolutely. What, up or down, what do you reckon? We're going to go up to the substation floor. This way? That way. Right, right. let's go. I feel like I'm on the Death Star, like Darth Vader's gonna come behind us. Like, oh, this really is inside a mountain. Yeah. <laughs> you are lying, I'm starting to see why they call it Electric Mountain now. Yeah. What's actually happening in here as we speak? So in here right now, this is our 400 kV substation. So this is gas insulated switch gear that was uh, installed in the early 1980s. Back to very basics, forgive me, a substation. What is a substation? So this substation is here to connect uh, the Electric Mountain, so Dunarwick Power Station. So basically we take electricity from the power station and we connect it to the national grid, grid network at this substation here. And how much power is going through this place at the moment? Dunarwick works is a battery basically. So this is a giant battery. Yeah. How does that yeah. work? So, um, Electric Mountain has a, a lake at the top and a lake at the bottom. Um, and literally, the lake at the top acts like a battery. So, we, we, the power station pump water up into that lake, um, and that is potential energy. So, that water is stored at the top. Um, and then, when we need it, they open valves, they run that water through a turbine um, and ge to generate electricity. And how many homes, at, you know, at its peak capacity, could this place? Power. It's hundreds of thousands of homes. To know we can be supplying, you know, at, at times sort of five percent of the electricity for the whole of the UK. The whole of the UK. All of the UK. From the mountain. From the mountain. You'd hope yeah, so yeah. from a mountain, yeah. wouldn't you? So Ash, how many substations like this are there in the UK? So there are not many substations like this, but we have over 300 substations in the UK. So this is a gas insulated substation. So what does that mean? <laughs> so that is different to a lot of our substations in that. It's, uh, the insulation medium is sulfur hexafluoride or SF6. Okay. And that means that it is, uh, we, can, we can install it in a very compact place and we can actually touch it. That's, that's the gas insulation? So that is, that's a piece of gas insulated buzz bar what? and inside there is a live conductor. When you say we can touch it, do you mean I can touch it? We can touch that, absolutely. I mean, should yeah. we go, oh, yeah. together? Well, It'll be like ET. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's kind of vibrating. I feel like we've shared a moment yeah. here, Ash. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> So inside of there, there is wow. a, a live conductor at 400,000 400, volts. And that's going 
Yeah. I'm glad you told me that Absolutely. after I touched it. Yeah. <laughs> so a normal substation obviously would be outside and it would be air insulated. Yeah. My climate background tells me gas probably isn't the greatest thing in the world for the planet. That's right, yeah, yeah. Are yeah. you doing anything to kind of correct that? We will be replacing the substation so that we'll have almost 90% reduction of the gas that we've got here at the minute. So we have about, there's about 11,000 kilos of gas in the SF6 in, in this uh, substation. We're able to reduce that by 90%. Wow, that's huge. Absolutely massive, yeah, yeah. And how many people are you looking after this place? On a normal day, we'll have only one or two people here. Uh, but when we've got maintenance works or if we've got um, you know uh, fault repair work, say we can we can peak at you know 20 or 30 members of staff. It's real engineering work, and this equipment you know was is 40 years old. You know, so we've yeah. we've got um, uh, we had to call in specialists. You know, people who um, were here when the when the substation was built, um, and we've got equipment and tools that you know we've had to maintain and keep literally from from the day this place was was built. Uh, tools that we might not have used for 20 years. Wow, so you mentioned the mountain renovation, yep. <laughs> which I'm sure is not a small task, Ash. Is this the bit that's being replaced? So we'll be replacing the whole substation, okay. but we can't switch it all off at the once, so we have to do it in stages. So this is gonna be the first stage that we replace. And how do you get this out of a mountain? Section by section, this will be taken out, um, lowered down uh, on the lift on the crane that's above us, uh, and taken out, and the new equipment will be brought in. I thought it was hard work renovating my house. Yeah, <laughs> How yeah. are you going to do that? Absolutely, it's a real logistics challenge, absolutely. And, and especially because the rest of the substation is going to be live. I was going to ask that, so can, will it still produce power even though you're getting rid of this bit? This bit will be dead and disconnected, but the good thing about our network is that it's really resilient. So we, we, we design in lots of redundancy. Um, and that redundancy helps us to do this where we can take parts of it off, switch it off, work on it safely and have the live bits of the substation still buzzing away over there. This is where you come and reflect on all the amazing work you've done. Absolutely, yeah, <laughs> you can see the whole substation up here. It's quite some view, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's a great view. Yeah. Does, does that ever get old? No, it doesn't get old at all, no. And, you know, we talked a little bit about what you guys are doing here to bring this up to 21st century standards, but yeah. in terms of the Great Grid upgrade, how important is a site like this for what you're trying to do? Sites like this and sites, uh, you know, across the country are really, really important. We've got a huge amount of uh, offshore wind about to connect, you know, in the, across the next 10 years, um, batteries, other novel types of generation. So, you know, upgrading our network, upgrading our overhead lines and cables to take all that new infrastructure is really, really important. Yeah, because that transition to net zero sometimes can feel like a really far away thing. Yeah. Are you confident that we can get there? Absolutely, absolutely. So, in, you know, we've made huge strides over the last 10 years. Our power system is the fastest decarbonising power system uh, in Europe. There's a long way to go, but we've made, you know, huge strides over the last few years. And to you personally, Ash, I mean, you know, is that something that's close to your heart? Upgrading the network, connecting that new generation is, is really important to not only decarbonise the power system, but also to make, our, to make it much more secure yeah. uh, and much more much more reliable and, and you know reduce uh, re reduced costs for, 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 for the consumer and it's particularly important for the, the next generation as well isn't it because yeah, you know for kids and absolutely they're the kind of at the, the center of this aren't they really I think it's the next 10 years you know a vast amount of uh, our current workforce retires so it's really important that we inspire children to get into STEM subjects yeah. uh, and, and to you know follow those subjects through and come into our apprenticeship programs our engineering programs yeah. those schemes are open at the minute for uh, for recruitment um, we bring you in you we take you to our training center we put you up in a, a lovely warm accommodation we feed you <laughs> and we train you and teach you to come and look after this you didn't give me that event. same luxury <laughs> <laughs> how many people do you need to hire to to keep that transition going to net zero. Is yeah. there a number of people that we need? It's vast amounts of engineers. I mean, I don't think we could probably put a number on it, but it's, it's just really important that the next generation are inspired to, to come into engineering. Jobs here, there are engineers, but yeah. I guess you need people that aren't, you know, it's not just engineers, is it? National Woods is a really diverse workforce. And, you know, we have, we have lawyers, we have ecologists, we have people who specialize in flooding, we have people who um, specialize in recruitment. Marketing, in HR, social marketing, media. Social media, absolutely. So it's, yeah, it's, it's a great place and you can come in as, en come in as an engineer uh, and leave as an accountant. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a great place. Maybe that's what happened to me. Maybe I'll have a different yeah. job when I go home at the yeah, end of this. Absolutely. And then for you personally, what do you love about this so much? So there's a saying at National Grid, people generally come for net zero, yeah, but they stay for the people. 
It's a great team, everyone looks out for each other and we're all really, really passionate about what we do and achieving that. Zero. Are you hopeful for our transition to a greener future? Absolutely, I, I wouldn't be here if I wasn't. So we are now in the cable tunnels, James. Wow. So next oh. to us here is a live 400 kV oil filled cable. That's live? This is live. Right, yeah. on we go. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Oh my gosh. So what's, how much power is going through these right now? So, so the, each of these uh, cable circuits, and there's, there's two of them currently, can take full output of the, of the generator. Yeah. It's there. Absolutely. Look yeah. how close can, you are to it. And you can touch this as well. No, so, don't yeah. do it. Oh God. I'm not doing that. I trust you. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's amazing. So you're responsible for a lot of people, Ash, on site here. <laughs> how, how does that feel? It's, it's, a, it's a huge responsibility. Um, not only for them and, and, and their safety, but also for the, you know, the, the amount of the transmission system that we've got to look after and uh, keep safe and keep in service. Okay, so at this point here, this is where uh, the two cable circuits meet. They come together. So we've been in the number two tunnel, and this is the number one tunnel here where the, where the cables, cables come round. Um, so yeah, they're both, both buried in concrete here with a, with a concrete plinth separating them. I cannot get this out of my mind. This is all hand built. Yeah, it's all hand built. Everything. Yeah, Someone yeah. actually dug this. You can actually see um, on the wall there, you can see the drill marks. Can you see, see, the, see the lines where that would have been a drill bit as they would have been excavating this face? It just blows yeah. my mind. I cannot get over that. Amazing, isn't it? Yeah. And yeah. I, it feels like we're very much alone down here. But that's well, not the case, is it? We are now, um, but there was a time when we might not have been. So, um, so there are horseshoe bats used to come down into this tunnel. At the end of the tunnel, um, we've had to install some um, like chain mail and a, and a bat house to encourage the bats to stay at the top of the tunnel because we can't disturb them. Because that, that particular species are protected, aren't they? They are protected. So we, yeah. you, you yeah. take that really seriously? Absolutely take that really seriously. Yeah. When you took this job, did you realise that you were not only doing this, but also looking after some bats looking down after there? bats, great crested newts, <laughs> water voles. Really? You name it. Yeah, yeah, we look after them, definitely. This, I didn't, this, so there's loads of wildlife in here? So not in the tunnel, but all, our projects you know, span you know, the whole of the country. So whenever you're working, you know, and particularly working in you know, very be beautiful parts of the, of the country, you, know, you have to, you've got to look after the environment. Are we, that's it? I've seen everything I need to see inside? That's it, yeah. So the way to get out, about three quarters of a mile that way. I'm walking towards the bats. Towards the bats. I'm walking towards the bats. There you go. Substations or electricity from power generators, so things like turbines or solar panels or even electric mountains, is converted and routed into overhead lines and underground cables, where it's sent all across the country and distribution networks bring into our homes and businesses. And I've just found out there's over 22,000 pylons and over 4,500 miles of overhead lines that help do this on the transmission system. That's a lot of infrastructure to keep tabs on. So I want to find out a little bit more about how that's maintained and looked after. Onwards. I'm here in the muddiest field we could find, actually, between, I think, Northamptonshire that way and Buckinghamshire that way, in the United Kingdom, to meet a guy called Chris, who works for National Grid. He hangs out of helicopters and does something with pylons and cables. We're going to find out more. You must be Chris. Yeah. Nice Hello. to meet you. I'm James. Nice to meet you, James. Thanks for talking to us. No problem. In your natural habitat, Chris. Yeah, home from home. So. <laughs> well, Chris, we find you in familiar territory mm -hmm. in front of these pylons. Can you tell us a little bit about how you fit into this infrastructure, your role in the national grid? My current role is uh, specialist access and technology engineer. Specialist access, that sounds fun. It sounds like you've got some sort of AAA pass to get you backstage at the National Grid. What does that actually mean? Normal access, you sort of climb up the step leg on the actual tower itself. Yeah. The specialist access bit, we use helicopters or rope access. The Tom Cruise division. <laughs> yeah, you could say that. We suspend a basket with uh, two people in it under the helicopter and actually fly onto the conductors themselves. So kind of, you're like hanging out of it? Hanging underneath it. Whoa. About 30 to 50 metres beneath it and we access the uh, spaces, the conductors, carrying out repairs, replacing spaces. Did you get scared? Um, no, I haven't done it. <laughs> so you don't get scared anymore because you, what, have you done it I guess a long time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been involved in uh, National Grid for 36 years. I joined at 16 as an apprentice straight from school. Um, 
always been involved in overhead lines as an uh, overhead line craft person. What does that mean? What does that mean? What, which one's the overhead line? Overhead line? Well, the overhead Literally line no. and the tower, the wires, all encompasses that. So for 20 years, I worked basically building pylons, maintaining them, replacing all the assets that hang off the pylons. How do you know what you're supposed to be fixing and repairing? Well, the, the helicopter unit, they all identify the defects. It gets fed back into the defect management team and they then filter it down to the operations team to actually go out and actually uh, do carry out the repairs. So when you're in the basket hanging yeah. out the helicopter, mm -hmm. what a great sentence. <laughs> How long are you actually in there for? Generally 20 minutes. So the helicopter unit is one part of the special access mm -hmm. that you work on. What are some of the other special access parts that you have? The, the other part is all rope access. So it's abseiling, much like you do in sort of a go ape sort of for <laughs> yeah. indoor sort of environment. We, we actually use that on these towers as well. So where does this might be a silly question? Where does it? Where does the rope like from the top to the bottom kind of thing? Yeah. You get yourself up to the top yeah. and you abseil down yes. to check yeah. what's happening. Yes. So on these. These sorts of towers are probably very rarely use a specialist axis. We use a specialist axis at the rope axis side of things on more unusual towers. Um, the T pylon is a perfect example where we probably will end up using some form of rope access. Yeah. It's all new, so it's, we're all trying to sort of invent new things and come up with different ideas how we can access things. Is that part of your role as well, trying to find out, kind of invent new ways of yeah. getting to stuff, basically? Yeah, well, it's, it's equipment and coming up with new access methods. Let's talk pylons. Mm. It'd be rude not to. Have you got a favourite pylon, a favourite series of pylons that you worked on, proud of? The favourite thing I've ever done is probably when we refurbished the Seven Crossing, which are 450 foot river crossings down near Bristol. Um, but for me, that was one of my biggest achievements because I had to design a completely new rig to replace the insulators and we had nothing to actually trial it on. Oh, wow. Yeah. What did that feel like when it, when it worked? Well, presumably it worked. It's a relief. <laughs> <laughs> So there's a lot more to your role than just hanging out of a helicopter. Yes. Yeah. It's a fantastic place to work. I just love the environment. I travel the country, different place every day. The office is different every day. Um, fantastic bunch of people I work with. The overhead line teams, the uh, camaraderie. And for people that sort of watch this and go, oh, I'm 16, I'm 17, I, I'm at that stage where I want to look at apprenticeships. Mm -hmm. It's on the National Grid Careers page. They're actually recruiting at the moment. I think we're talking 10 apprentices every year for the next five years. Wow. So there's huge opportunities all over the country for sort of youngsters to come in. You think of these things, you think of like engineering and big tech. Mm -hmm. Do you have to have that background or is that something you can yeah. learn? It's all taught during the apprenticeship. So that you're bought as a 16, 17 year old and you're taught everything you need to know during your apprenticeship. You come away with your qualifications at the end of it as well. Tell me, Chris, about the Great Grid upgrade and particularly the role of net zero and how important that is. It's really all about um, creating more capacity on a network. I think there's something around 50, 50 gigawatts of extra power that's going to be um, required to be flowed down through the uh, national grid over the next 20 years, I think. So. Of, re of renewable energy? Yes. So how long is that going to take? Are we talking sort of short term, long term? It, it's going to be short term. I mean, the target the company we're working to is 2030, which is a massive undertaking with the amount of infrastructure build that's got to be put in place within that's only six years now, isn't it? Chris, I know you do way more than hang out of a helicopter, mm -hmm. but that's all I can think about. And I, I need to meet the people responsible to help you with that. Can we meet the helicopter team? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's uh, go and find John. John. And I'll introduce you to him. This way. Okay. Chris, we've got someone else with me now. Yeah, this is uh, John Rigby, our uh, chief pilot. John. John. Hello. Nice to meet you, mate. Uh, James. Hey, nice to see you. James. Nice to see, see you. you. Thank you okay. so much no earlier. Problem. Lovely to see you. No, no From problem. the man that he hangs out of these. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Yeah. <laughs> you that. you don't normally see each other in the same plane, no, do you? Right. <laughs> I was going to ask you what you do, but there's a, a fairly large clue behind us. Yeah, so, um, so I'm the chief pilot of the National Grid Transmission Helicopter Unit, and Doug is uh, one of the observers in the back. So oh, this yeah. is a Bell 4 like 29 helicopter. And we've got two of these, and they're the kind of primary workhorse um, to generate lots of imagery of towers and we feed that to the condition monitoring team who then look at when do things need refurbishing, what is a high priority defect, what can be left and refurbished at a later date. So your job is to sort of fly around and make sure all the pylons are as they should be? Uh, yeah, I think it's, it's really a, a very comprehensive health check, um, very up close and personal with the pylons in the, in the hover a lot of the time. How close are we talking like? Well, yeah, our minimum is about 50 feet. Oh, gosh. But um, this, this camera here on, on the front, this oh, yeah, is yeah, uh, yeah. a sort of military grade camera. Wow. And it'll do thermal mode. It's got a very uh, capable zoom lens. 
so you can get some very high resolution pictures. A lot uh, of buttons, John. Oh, I'm assuming you know system. what all these do. Basically, flight displays here, engine displays there, mapping displays there, a wow. little bit more buttons, autopilot. But it's a fully um, instrument uh, rated machine as well, so we can fly in cloud to get to, uh, to places, so that's quite handy sometimes. It's a very modern helicopter, so that's, that's a nice thing. It's got some really interesting uh, latest avionics, really good autopilot. So we can, that's good, it's very comfortable, it's very vibration free, it's an excellent platform for what we do, very stable. Yeah. Uh, it's quite good in the wind as well. Um, wind does tend to affect us quite a bit and this is a nice stable uh, platform. So it, it's, it's a joy to fly really, we're, we're very lucky to, to have these machines. Yeah. Can we go up? Absolutely, we're, we're ready to go, we're fully fueled. Oh, you're waiting for me? The weather's fine, yeah. It does, the sun's just come out. At Western Grid 01, request to start Hangar 7. Uh, we're 5 POB and 4 A at Eastleigh departure. And the weather is looking good for our transit to Tower ZL311. I mean, it's a gorgeous evening. It is lovely, isn't this it? Is, this is like sort of peak helicopter time, isn't it? It's a good first time to cover a helicopter. Well, you've got nice conditions. How much land do you cover? You said there's two helicopters, so this one and a sort of a twin. Yeah. Are you covering the whole country? Well, it's England Wales at the moment for the uh, National Grid transmission. Uh, so we do get around quite a bit. We're a very <laughs> um, nomadic uh, unit. We have all our luggage in the back, uh, and we, we rather than coming back to our, our base each time, we will actually go to where the work is. Uh, and then maybe stay overnight in hotels. So the, the guys are used to living out of a bag really? in hotels. So it, it can be quite, um, you know, a lot of time away from home. Each day we're trying to do about five hours worth of flying. Two and a half hours in the morning, two and a half hours in the afternoon. So wow. you've got to concentrate for that long. The observer in the back has got to make sure he's keeping his concentration levels up because he's looking at, at footage. and He's got to maybe spot a small defect, um, you know, even though he might be seeing, you know, 50, 60 towers that day that he's inspecting, so it's, uh, it requires pretty high concentration levels. Okay, I think I can see 311, so I'll position into wind, sunny side, give you the best possible pictures. Okay, off to my left here is the uh, the pylon. Oh yeah, there it is. Very nice. Uh... Oh wow, look at that. Yeah, look at that. On the screen you can see it's the ZL311. That's the one. Okay, so I'm just going to get my uh, digital camera out, taking a whole series of pictures, working up the tower, this is Doug, one of our uh, Doug. observers. Lovely to meet you, I'm James. Hi James, pleased to meet you. This is your office. This is my office, wow. yeah. Wow, it's um, like a games console. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Superb. So well, I've got my controller for the camera here. Yeah. This is the uh, Avalex recorder. What's that do? So it basically records all the video. Oh, everything that's, okay, yep. handy. And, uh, and then uh, obviously the screen, and then I've got a couple of iPads, one running the Let's mapping. Have a look. Yeah, sure. Oh, oh that is a, that's not just a Google Maps. That is oh, no, no, no. This <laughs> that's is, so we can we can zoom out and we've got all the airspace and, and what have you on And that there. tells you where the pylons are, does it? Uh, it does indeed. We've got an overlay on it. So uh, I can zoom in and get the exact ident on a pylon. I can't get the pylon so, map on my phone, can I? No. 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 Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, the other iPad's got the tracker. We, we have a, a, a tracker system so that each uh, tower that we film, yep. we uh, colour code it according to whether we've been able to record the details or whether we've had to uh, bypass it because of horses or property or something like that. So what are you looking for in these pylons? What, what are you hoping to see? What are you hoping not to see when you're looking through the camera? Sure, so we've got three different surveys that we do. So the first one is with a uh, steel work and I've got uh, a digital camera uh, with a big zoom lens on it. So I literally sit in the back, open up the window and then I take thousands and thousands of pictures every day. Actually open the window? Yeah, just at this uh, slide. Oh, I see. <laughs> you like a sort of pylon paparazzi, aren't you? Basically, yes. yeah. Uh, we'll take anywhere sort of up to 2,000 pictures a day. What do you do with them at the end? So, uh, they get analysed by a team. And so we've got a set sequence that we follow. Because if you can imagine doing this day in, day out, and what you don't want to do is lose track of where you are. That's all looking pretty good. Can I tell you a secret, Doug? I'm trying so hard to concentrate on what you're saying, but I'm absolutely terrified. Are you really? <laughs> What's <laughs> so frightening about this? <laughs> I mean, what could possibly go wrong? We use the uh, uh, daylight camera on the yeah, MX-10. Yeah, the big one. You've yeah. seen. Uh, so we're looking, I'm looking at all the fixtures there and fittings on the pylon. So the, the shackles, the nuts, the bolts, the split pins for wear and tear and damage in general. And then the last one, which we're doing during the winter months, is uh, we do infrared patrols. So we're looking for hot joints on the angle towers. That's uh, sort of an indication that the, the joint isn't as it should be. There's, uh, there's a bit of resistance there 
and we, we get the heat signature. I mean, someone has to go up and fix it. Yeah, see the 11 o'clock, um, James, you might be able to see it, I don't know. Yeah. The substation, so we've got a bit of sun lit on, on the uh, substation at the moment, which makes it really difficult to work out what's, what's a hot joint, what's reflection from uh, the sun. Yeah. But you can see that the uh, transformers are really glowing nice and hot there. So they're working, are they? They're working, they're working hard. How many, I've got a quiz you now, how many substations are there in the UK? Oh, oh, good, good question, actually. Have you seen them all? I've seen every single one of them. Oh, that's how I'll do. They don't all terminate with overhead lines, so we tend yeah. to see about 240. I know there's something like 22,000 towers yeah. that we look at or thereabouts. Have you got a favourite route, favourite area? I think, uh, round, for me, it's the um, round the Snowdonia route. There's a lovely oh. route from Connors Quay round to uh, Carnarvon and then back to uh, Tross Finneth, so that's really lovely. There's a route that goes from Carlisle across to Newcastle. Nice. And it follows Hadrian's Wall, and it wow. is just fantastic. Yeah, it's really, really cool. good scenery. Beautiful. You wouldn't get that view anywhere else, would you? No, no. Every time you see a pylon from now on, you're going to remember this Every day. Every time I turn my phone on and I've charged it at night, I'm going to be like, Doug's up there, making sure that's OK. Absolutely. It's quite sensitive. Always very sensitive. Ah, yeah, look at that. Oh my gosh, Doug, you made this look so easy. I feel like, you remember the first time you played a PlayStation? Yeah. You're rubbish. Right. So we want that bit there. Oh, that bit there. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's well, the wrong. I said the opposite. What? Hang on. Go left a bit and down a bit. Yeah, so it's like an aeroplane, not like a PlayStation, yeah? yeah? I'm, I'm figuring that out. Yeah. It's quite good because it's distracting me from thinking about where we actually are. Good man. Now, John, how did you get into all this? It's one of the more unusual jobs in National <laughs> Grid, isn't it? I wasn't expecting to find a helicopter. Yeah, I spent 20 years in the Air Force flying uh, Chinook helicopters wow. on various operations. Uh, the double, main, double bladed ones. Yeah, that's yeah. right, yeah. The intermeshing rotors, which uh, was quite sporty. But um, <laughs> we, we spent a lot of time at low level, and then I, I left the Air Force. I joined uh, an air ambulance, and again, more time at low level. And then a job with National Grid came up, and again, it was more time spent in the low level operating environment, it seemed quite well suited so uh, you know it's been it's been a really good uh, good uh, career move to come here working for National Grid it's uh, really enjoyable and uh, National Grid are a great company to work for so um, it's, it's just nice to fly an aircraft with uh, with National Grid on the side you know it's great. My previous employment was as a police officer and I spent 20 years on the police helicopters and cut my teeth on the cameras uh, doing that so. Looking at very different kinds of things I'd, totally, I'd imagine. Yeah, yeah. yeah totally yeah. And then you enjoy looking more on the pylons perhaps than. Uh, yeah I mean the pylons <laughs> don't run away from me so uh, it's great. Well, let's hope not. <laughs> yeah. I think it's amazing that all of this stuff exists and no one really thinks about it and no. here you guys are making sure it's all working so that I can go home and boil my kettle tonight. Yeah and, and a lot of this kit has been around since the 50s. Some of the pylons are still standing from back from the 50s and 60s. Um, wow. They're still that good. Good engineering. Well done, that's not really. Yeah, absolutely. I spy something we can do with me. Give you a clue there, James. A, a pelican. A pelican? No, right not. <laughs> could it be a pylon? Could be, could be. No, I haven't seen many of those today. No, so. no, no, not at all. I'm in the market for one. <laughs> Right guys, you can unstrap and open doors and uh, go about your business, but thanks for flying National Grid Airways. <laughs> <laughs> Doug, John, thank you for letting me fly National Grid Airways. Apart from the food, it was an amazing trip. Now, honestly, seeing what you guys do, and it's so simple, I'm going to go home and make a cup of tea, and when I flick that switch on, I'll, I'll think of you <laughs> flying high above the pylons. Uh, one last question. Can I have a ride home? <laughs> Casual check. <laughs> yeah. No? It's expensive. Oh, next time. See you, boys. <laughs> High voltage electricity is moving through these overhead lines and underground cables and they sort of shuttle between substations which are dotted across the whole country. It's an incredible operation and one that requires constant monitoring, maintenance, upgrading and much more. But there is another element to our electricity grid, because the electricity flowing through these overhead lines and underground cables is at a really high voltage. And well, you need to convert that, otherwise your kettle will blow up and your TV would short circuit. So the real question is, how does it get from here to our sockets? But first, I need a couple. 